Okay, let's see if this sounds any better. And here's it. There, we got some sound in there. I, I think that is it. So hopefully that works better. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start making... <laughs> oh. What's that? Oh. B Power said he's going to start making up my own words for his lips. And so that made me think of <laughs> bad lip syncing for football. So um, if you can hear me now, let me know. Um, Better. But yeah, we got the, the overhead mic in here, and I got it um, trimmed up so that now there's actually a decent thing in there. So I'm going to be playing with that. Let me know if you like the overhead mic, and I can switch back and forth. And so now when I switch mics, I can actually uh, switch mic, uh, mic Videos. cameras. Camera. There shouldn't be any lines now between them. So you get this nice Ooh. clean balance between them. Isn't that cool? So fancy. So, uh, <laughs> next up, we'll fix the audio. <laughs> no, I just, I, I just had to reinstall my audio... Um, mixing software that then ships it off, and so I think when I re put it in there, I didn't change the audio settings. <laughs> so, should I turn down this other one then? Yeah, the second one in. The second. The second one? one in. Turn that off. All the way to the level left. two. Yep. All the way off. Yep. Okay. That's the overhead. Are we still good? Over the place. That should eliminate any echo. Cool. Um, so uh, we're gonna be doing pocket holes today. <laughs> So, so if you didn't hear any of that, turn up the volume. <laughs> uh, yeah, we were just using, apparently just using the microphone on the little um, webcam up top. So, so let's do uh, some pocket holes. Now, we're first going to talk about the history of pocket holes because that is, uh, a lot of people think that pocket holes are a new thing invented by someone named Craig. Um, and that is not true. Um, oh, someone turned down the blue light. Oh, oh Alan Smith, thank you. Let's pocket. get the dancing done early. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you, Alan. Uh, I was going to say Craig Jig. Um, and the Craig Jig is a new take on a very old oh, thing. Uh, and so I have this one here to show you. And I, I got this, I don't know how long ago, and I've only used it a couple times. And there are times when this is really nice. You just want to throw something together, even temporarily, or just shop furniture. A Craig Jig is a great way to do it and to, like, uh, 15 bucks or so you get yourself a bit and a jig and you can clamp them on there and go to town um, but a lot of people think this is what started pocket holes and to be honest this is only the newest rendition of them pocket holes are actually hundreds of years old and if you go and find old furniture you will probably find them um, particularly holding the skirt holding a table down to a skirt and the reason for that is the table top expands and contracts and pocket hole screws are really good because they have a little bit of movement. There's a little bit of gap in there where they can slide around. And that allows the top to expand and contract. So when the board is running across the grain and the tabletop wants to expand and contract, the board can still slide underneath it. And so pocket holes are great there. Um, anytime when you're working in a cross grain situation where you want that movement, pocket holes um, work fantastically. And historically, they were done with a bit like this, um, but not one that's actually broken. Uh, so let me show you. Uh, this is a pocket hole bit, and you see how the square t uh, the square shank on here allow you to put it into a regular brace. Um, now the tip on it is normally about that long. Unfortunately, today when I was doing the practice, uh, I dropped a tool on it and snapped the tip off. And it was really sad because I wanted to show you how this works. So I'm going to be I'm going to do a, a little demonstration to show you basically how this works. Um, but this would drill in the hole, kind of like this would do. But rather than being the full thickness the rest of the way back, it stopped here. You also know it's tapered, and it's very, very wide. And the reason it's very, very wide is so you have the big, because uh, we think of screws now as these. This is a very large screw. And you can see the, the tapered uh, uh, flat head on here. But older wood screws actually were much, much larger with a flat shank. And so this would be large enough to fit the head of a large flat screw. So this is the, the, the traditional um, jig doing for it. But then there's also a way where you can just use a chisel. And so I'm going to show you how to do that. And I have all three of them here that I was playing with earlier. So you've got the Craig jig. You have these ones that are the, the big heads so that they can actually fit a large screw in there. And then this one is cut out with a chisel. Uh, so first let me show you how to do a Craig jig with hand tools. Uh, because for most people, that's going to be the... the the easiest way to do it is just to get a jig and go to it. Here, I'm going to turn this off for a moment. Otherwise, that one's going to start annoying me. The blue one, for some reason, has an extra sound to it. Um, but thank you, Alan. Um, what was I just saying? Oh, Craig Jig. 
Um, oh, oh, yeah. Before we do that, though, I have to talk about wood okay. grain orientation. Your hands are crazy in that upper screen. What? I'm sorry. Oh, this? <laughs> yes, that, that... it's so distracting. <laughs> <laughs> I just noticed it. Because you're going like, you're, get, you're turning into a little well, Italian I can, woman. I can also do uh, this and put this camera on the second screen so you can see the smaller focus. Uh, so I could do that. I don't know if it was bothering anybody else. It just happened to catch my me. eye. So, yeah, let me know what you think. Because I'm kind of playing with this um, now that I have the new switcher and uh, the, the better focus on the camera. This is They're all going to notice it now. <laughs> yes. Um, oh, yes. Oh, that's what I was talking about. Wood grain. Um, so a lot of times people are thinking about joinery as with the Craig jig as you have a 1x4 and a 1x4 and you put them together cross grain. You run a screw from one end to the other. Um, and it's basically, with traditional joinery, you would create a tenon and you'd put it into the mortise and you'd socket them into each other. Uh, whereas with a Craig jig, the Craig jig allows a little bit of movement, which if you are worrying about wood movement, that's, that's a good thing. But most of the time when you're in this orientation, wood movement is not a problem. And so a mortise and tenon is a stronger connection. Now, do you need that extra strength? Maybe, maybe not. Um, and a lot of people are going to argue that the Craig jig pocket holes are perfectly strong enough for that. And in most applications, yes, they are. But in a lot of applications, I, I don't know. I, 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 long term and with any sideways movement, the screws just aren't quite as strong. But if it's something in your shop or something you're just throwing together quickly, that's more than all the strength you're going to need. If you want it to be, you know, a hundred year old piece of furniture, Maybe, maybe not. The jury's still out on that. There aren't a whole lot of things put together that way because historically the reason you would do that is to attach a skirt to a tabletop. And so you'd have the tabletop here and the skirt would be on there. And so you'd run your pocket holes up through that into the tabletop to, to move it. Um, and that you want the, the wood movement and you want to be able to take the top off. You don't want to be able to glue it down. Um, and so that's the more common place that historically pocket holes were used. Um, so I don't advocate doing straight joinery unless it's you know something temporary or it's something for your shop or something you're just you're putting together in which case it's great. I did that a lot when I was making sets for uh, for theater because pocket holes the show would be up for six months and then it'd be taken down and that's that's a great use for it because it's gonna last that long. Um, then the other question comes grain orientation. So if you've got one going into the other, do you run the pocket, do you run the screw with the grain of the board you're going through and against the grain that you're going into, or do you run it the opposite direction and run it across the grain from the board you're going into and then with the grain in the board you're going to be sinking it into? And that really depends on what you're working with because there are a couple different problems that come up with it. Uh, let me switch back to this. One, two. Um, is that... When you, let me grab something to point with. I'll focus this a little bit more for you. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo, there we go. So in here, this block of wood really isn't very strong and could easily be ripped out. And particularly on the Craig jig, you have a, about a quarter inch or so of wood in the end. But with the Craig jig, you actually have more support because you have some fibers that come all the way up here. If you chop it with a chisel, you don't have as much support there. Um, with, these, with the larger bit, you actually have a lot of support there because you start it farther back. Uh, and because of that, it really doesn't matter which way you're going to do it. Whereas if you go from one end to the other, if when the screw goes through this into that, because it's cutting into these cross grain, it's going to have a lot of connection into this board. Oops, sorry, let me move down a little bit. It's going to have a lot of connection into this board because it's cutting cross grain and it's going to want to rip out these fibers in here. But with the strength of a Craig jig hole, uh, it's really not going to have a chance to rip out all these fibers. So if you're using a Craig jig, it's structurally more sound to go with the grain here and then into the cross grain. And if you go to Craig jig's website, that's what they recommend. If you're chopping out the mortise, if you're chopping out the, the pocket hole, it's probably a little bit stronger to go across the grain here because you're going to have a thinner piece. But in most of what I'm going to be doing today, I'm going to be actually doing them even with the Craig jig. 
I'm going to be running them the opposite way that Craig Jig says. So I'm going to be putting through the uh, across the grain and into the end grain. And the reason I'm going to be doing that is because most of the time you're going to have this board and you're going to secure it to a tabletop. And so you're going to be going across the grain and into the tabletop. And so that's that's the way that I use pocket holes the most. So most of the time I'm going to be going across the grain here. So don't start yelling at me. No, you need to go into the end grain because I almost never join boards with a screw this way. That's just a bad joint. Uh, you might as well use a, 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 a mortise and tenon if you're building something long. You know, temporarily it's going to hold it, but it's just not as strong as a mortise and tenon. But that's where arguments start. <laughs> Any uh, pertinent questions before I go on to actually demonstrating? Um, we have a question. It's not necessarily related to what you're doing right this second. Okay. Well, I'm setting this up. I can answer. So, Sam, well, Sam had Sam Rios had actually had two questions. I kind of answered one. The first one is, why do you wear the wooden shoes? Because they are incredibly comfortable, number one. And number two, they protect your feet. And number three... Um, people ask a lot of questions about them, so I'm fine. <laughs> but no, they are incredibly comfortable. Um, I am in these all day long in the concrete, and I, I love them. I wear them literally every day. They are not good for running in. They're not good for going up and down stairs in. But for walking around and standing, they are phenomenal, and I, I wear them all the time. The other thing I like about it is that I can slip them on and off quickly. Um, so we have carpet and we go socks in the house, but my shop is in the basement, so I can come down and slide them onto my feet and slide them off when I leave. So I don't have to worry about that as much. And then he had one other question. And if you want to see a video, I had to show the video of how I carved them too. And it was, what was his last question? Which is the power tool that you still use the most? Um, the handheld power router, probably the most. Um, if If I wasn't, on a deadline for creating videos, I probably wouldn't because I find the planes far more fun. I would rather spend an entire day down the shop hand planing than running a power plane over it, but the power planer is a bit faster. So um, in order to meet the deadlines and get videos out, I, I'll pull that one out. Um, I've also used the, uh, the router sled for flattening, and then every now and then I'll pull a drill out, but that's, that's about the extent of it. So, yeah. Um, okay, let's start with the Craig jig. Um, now, for the Craig jig here, move this one back, and maybe move this up a little bit. Do, 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 do. There we go. Um, now, with the Craig jig, the problem is how do you hold this in place so it doesn't slide around? Especially if you're going across the board like you would be on the skirt. Now, the way Craig has is they have a clamp that you can get and squeeze down, and I could grab. Oh, stink, all my C-clamps are away. I could grab a C-clamp, C clamp that down, put it in the vise and do that. But I've got these things on the bench called holdfasts that are incredibly fun. Um, and these make it a lot easier for me. So I can put that on here. I can put this on here. I've got to move it over here so I can actually reach it. And I can grab my mallet. And that's held in place. Grab my Craig jig bit and a brace. Now, one of the problems with the bit is that it's rounded, and so you have to have a brace that works with it. This chuck is okay with it, but I have to crank it down a good ways in order for it to stick in. But yes, you can run other bits in a brace. I'll start it in here. It's going to wind on me until I get going. And then we can bore it in. So just like a drill, oh, it slips. We can drill ourselves a pocket hole. Oops, it slips. <laughs> <laughs> so you can say the round ones are not great for a brace chuck, but they do work. It just takes a little bit more time. Take the mallet, pop that off, and there we've got our pocket hole all ready to go. Then for the, the screw, I grabbed the wrong board, didn't I? Oh well. I was going to drill through this one because it was a little bit thicker. Uh, for the screw, we have the standard Craig screws. And these have a nice flat surface here to actually connect with it. 
So I can slide that in, and I've got my Sounds. other brace. Where did my other brace go? Oh, oh, it's right here in front of me. <laughs> um, and this has an octagonal shank. And most brace um, chucks will hold the, not octagonal, hexagonal. <laughs> will hold a hex chuck, a uh, hex bit. But not all, um, so you have to kind of check it. And then you can drive your screw. This is a square bit. And just like that, we have created a nice, strong there you go, connection. Voila. Now, that is the way that most people think about it. And in all honesty, that's probably the way I would do it if I did it with hand tools. But if I'm going to be using a Craig jig, I'm probably going to pull the drill out because it's, it's already feels like cheating. So I'd rather just continue the cheating. <laughs> Um, so I want to show you the historical drill bit, which is this one. Now, normally this has a tip on it that, focus in a little bit, um, it's basically, it looks like a screw. So it looks like that basically. And that tip then is something you can start into the wood and will pull it into place. But unfortunately I dropped something on it today and snapped that off. So in replacement, I'm going to start off with a regular uh, drill bit and show you what I do for that. First, let's move this over a little bit so we can start in a new place. <laughs> oh, wait. Questions? Oh, look at the little balls. Going. Oh, someone's spinning the balls on the bench. Justin Ford. Ford. <laughs> Thanks, man. Oh, it's fuzzy. That's so sad. Oh, here, you fix that, sorry. That's better. There you go. Um, but you have to answer a question now. What's that? It says, in a similar theme of a spirit animal, what What would your, no, what, what would, would your spirit handbook, what? What's that? Spirit hand. Hand what's tool? Your, hand tool. <laughs> it's like My mine. spirit hand tool. Half inch chisel. Oh, I could Simple, make I could make so many jokes right now. <laughs> well, what do you think my spirit hand tool is? <laughs> this is dangerous. I would say a plane, because you like planes of all variety. I do. I like most hand tools of all variety. I know. But you like to fly planes, and you like to... Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, planes. Uh -huh, see? Uh, I thought you were referring to my planeness. I hadn't even gone there. I was just going to tell you, you go, you picked a chisel, and then I, I was going to make a comment about not being that sharp, but... Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I love you, though. So we're going to start this in um, about an inch and a quarter back from the joint, and start it in straight in, and as we start getting the dimple, we're going to come back and come back and come back until we're at a fairly steep angle here. You can go a little bit lower before I start there coming back farther. There's an evil farther. device from the ancients of the story. And you see I have this in the end vise connected between two dogs. It makes it very easy to hold things like. in place. I don't have to worry about sliding. And I'm just going to go until I hear the, the sound change. And so basically, if I had the original bit, that's all I would do, and I'd be done right there. Because this would then start that hole, and once you got in a little ways, then you can crank it down, and you'd run it at that angle. But because I don't have it, I've got to start it with one and then put the other one in. Now, this hole is going to look really bad. And the reason it looks really bad is because it's cut with such a big head. Um, <laughs> wow, that could go really bad. Um, and we're going cross grain here, so every time it chips through, it's going to pop out on the other side. And you start to see these chips coming off here. And if you look at the underside, of a lot of old tables, you'll see those chips where it's busted out. But it's the underside of the table, so who cares about the underside of the table? So once we got it into there, clean it out, and now you've got your hole that you can run screws into. But you don't want to use the, the flat surface of a Craig screw. You want to use a wood screw that has a flat head. And so we're going to put this one in there. Actually, I'm going to use a shorter one. Put this one in there. And I need a bit to run it with. When you What's that? get a chance, 
I'm starting to get some questions with Sarah Wentz. That's right, Jean Chambers. Um, <laughs> yeah, go ahead and throw me because I'm just going to screw this in. Okay. Well, I will gently toss them at you. Um, oh, I just... Okay, yeah, Just like that. One of the nice things about a brace, though, is you get a very uh, fine adjustment into how much pressure you put on this. So... Um, a brace can have an incredible amount of torque. You can really drive something in, but you then get to feel the amount of pressure you're putting onto it. So it's kind of nice for that. And there you go, joint. So what's the question? <laughs> uh, Matthew Anderson asked, what are some other connections that can secure a tabletop to a skirt, particularly without screws? Um, you know, when I first got into woodworking, I was really worried about that too because I was always looking for how do you do it without screws? How do you, there's got to be some way of doing it without screws. And to be completely honest, historically and in almost every way, screws are how you do it. Um, screws are just a smart way of doing it. And so now when I do most of my tabletops, with a few exceptions, um, I put screws. And I like to use those little figure eight clamps. Um, I like those little pieces of hardware. They work really well. Um, but if you really don't want to use it, the way to do it is the, the skirts that go across the grain. So if you have the table running this way and the grain running with my fingers, the skirts that go across the grain, those two skirts, you have a sliding dovetail that slides into the tabletop. And that sliding dovetail will allow the wood to expand and contract along that sliding dovetail. Um, and that looks cool, but in all honesty, in long term, that's not a good strong joint because the skirt, you, you're, just, you're just holding on to the long grain to long grain of that dovetail holding in. And so it, over time, that's going to want to separate. Um, and I've seen a couple tabletops where they were attached that way and it's, it's starting to break off. It's not a great way to connect to a table. Um, so in all honesty, the best way is, is using screws. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I know it sounds horrible, but there, there really isn't a great cross grain connection that will hold its integrity um, long term without hardware. What else you got? Cats Steel asked, "Were you inspired by Woodwright Shop on PBS?" Um, honestly, I never saw that until after I got into hand tool. I mean, I I had seen it, but I never actually watched the show until after I got into doing hand tool woodworking. Um, and the reason being is because until I got into hand tool woodworking, I was power tools only. I mean, I had a set of chisels, but they were, well, here, I think I have one of them. There were these um, craftsman chisels that uh, are really stinking horrible. <laughs> um, and yeah, and I thought this was a good chisel and I had no idea what sharp was. I mean, this thing is, this thing is, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we should put a little thing across the video at that point for people not watching live. <laughs> um, and so I watched the wood by right, uh, the wood right shop then, and I thought this guy's idiot, and I never paid much attention to it. But then once I got into hand tools, I was like, oh yes, and I went through all thirty seasons. Um, and well, now there's more out than that, but uh, it was it was a lot of fun. <laughs> what else? Let's see, Alex Rivas asked, what made you want to use just hand tools and not power tools? Um, moving into our net, well, I ended up selling most of my power tools as we moved several times. And before my son, my, my youngest reached three years old, he lived in five different houses. Um, and so we moved and moved and moved. And every time we moved, I sold more tools and sold more tools. And the last house we were in, I sold basically all the tools I had. And I said, well, I guess I'm never woodworking again. Um, and we moved into this house and I have a space that's, uh, uh, it was 10 foot by 11 foot, and so I thought, you know, I wonder if I could do it with hand tools after watching a couple of videos on YouTube, and I'm a stay-at-home dad, so it's got to be safe for the kids, it's quiet, it's dust-free, and it's something that I can, I can enjoy my time rather than just focusing on completing a project. And all those things came together, working in a small space, it was just, that's exactly what I wanted. And so I got to learn woodworking all over again, doing hand tools. Um, any others before I jump in next? Um, yeah, I have a couple, but I don't know if you want to get started. Right, let's start into this. I might throw out some other things. The, the last way I want to show is actually just using a chisel. Um, and if you saw when I did the, I did a video, a, a, a joinery window. And so it's a, it's, it's a, it has, um, what, six boards and nine joints. So it looks like a little four pane window. 
and each corner is a different joint, and each of the cross members have a different joint. Um, and one of the joints I put in there was a pocket hole. And you can do a pocket hole with just a screwdriver. Uh, screwdriver, just a chisel. <laughs> um, so I want to show you this. Um, for this one, we do want to use the regular um, Craig style screws. Uh, because they have this flat surface here that you can suck up against. So what you want to do is you want to find a chisel that is wider than your screw, but not too much wide. So this one is actually thinner than the screw, uh, thinner than the chisel. So I'm going to have to cut it a little bit wider. So what I'm going to do is I'm put this in here, and I'm going to put it in about, uh, about a half inch back. Tip it at a slight angle. What that angle is, I really don't care too much. I'm going to move it over a little bit and hit it again. Then I'm going to put the head on there and see, is that wide enough? And so that's right about what I want. Then with this one, actually I'm going to use a, use a 3 quarter inch chisel. And I'm going to come back here because I'm cutting cross grain. I'm going to tap that in and tap that in. And then we can come in with this chisel and pair out. And this is the fun part. I just, I don't know why, but this Pairing out action is just so enjoyable. You can chop in a little deeper now. And then chop in a little deeper here. And it's just going to be back and forth like that. Questions? Um, let's see. Sorry, I hear children screaming in the other room. Um, <laughs> children are always screaming. James Friedman? Friedman? Not sure I'm saying that right. He, he just, found up, just found us on YouTube, so he's new. Cool. Um, Good to have you, man. Wants to know what is your favorite project to build? Uh, my favorite project to build, whatever project I currently am focused on. Um, my favorite project that I have built, I think now is the table, the dining room table that I just finished. That was a lot of fun. The dresser that I made a while ago is probably the most challenging one I've ever had. Um, but yeah, probably the table is my favorite one that I've worked on. But at any particular time, whatever project I'm working on is the one that has my attention. And so it's usually the one that I am really interested in. And I want to cut this down to a depth. So when I put the head in backwards, the head is flush. So I need to go down a little bit farther. And the angle doesn't matter that much as long as it is flat enough. So in this case, I'm actually going to have to come back past the end here um, in order to make the angle low enough, if that makes any sense. Normally, this would be done with a much thicker board. Um, it would normally be like three and a half inches wide as opposed to this being like inch and three quarter wide. here. Just like that. Let's pair this out and we should be about ready. Any other questions? Oh uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Tyler Pestle asked, what makes it a bad chisel? Can't you just sharpen it? Talking about the craftsman. Oh, so many things make this a bad chisel. Um, number one, and most importantly, the handle design on this is just horrible. It's, it's painful. The, the, the sheer plastic on it is just bad. The steel button on here means that I, I really don't want to use my wooden mallets. Um, I need to make sure I'm using a hammer on this. Uh, on top of that, this thing is so thick that it just becomes a, a pain to use. Um, the steel it does not hold its edge for anything. It's just, it just it dulls out almost instantly. It's almost like a mild steel. Um, and then this one actually has a secondary bevel on the back. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I didn't think anything of it when I bought it because I didn't know what chisels were, but that, that's like utter stupidity when it comes to chisels. Never, ever, 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 ever put a secondary bezel, bevel on the back. Um, that's just bad unless you're trying to make something that's not a bench chisel. Um, so there's just a lot of things in that that just make this a, an annoying chisel. Um, yeah. Enough of that. <laughs> so now we have this in here so that the head We'll go all the way down. I need to drill a pilot hole, otherwise if I start running that screw in there, 
It's just going to split out. So I'm going to put a bit into this, put a bit, put the hole right in the middle of that, and then run until I hear the tone change. There. Now I'm through this board and starting into that one. I'm going to back it off here. Because I'm going into the end grain of this board, I don't need to pilot hole that as much, especially in something like a walnut. If I was doing it in maple, then I might need to do that a little bit more. So let's drive in this bit. Oop, wrong one. Let's drive in this one, the one with the flat face and this bit. All of these screws here have different, uh, different threadings on them. So we can drive this in. And the nice thing about using the end vise here between dogs is that it's a very, very solid connection. And so the boards stay exactly where you want every time. And there you go. There's another pocket hole. So three different ways you can make a pocket hole. Three different ways you can have fun. Um, this one, the, the Craig jig is kind of nice because if you ever need to, you can put a dowel in it, flush cut off the dowel. This one, as long as you make the shape the size of a square peg you have, you can put a square peg in there and cut it off flush. This one um, pretty much always looks bad. I've never actually seen one of these that look good, uh, just because if you're going cross grain, you're always going to get tear out, and there's no way to fill this big pile of schmoo. But that's the historical way to cut a, uh, um, a pocket hole, which is kind of weird. And along that way, um, we think of pocket holes as being this really ugly, horrible thing. And they are. They just they don't look good. And so that's why we always put them underneath or behind things. And historically, when attaching a tabletop, they were always in the inside underneath a table. So you would have to climb on your back and look up in order to see them. Um, but historically, the view of dovetails is that they were ugly. And you would always try and hide dovetails. You'd never want to show off dovetails. And so that's why you have half blind and full blind dovetails. So you could make them completely disappear. Um, so dovetails are themselves something that a lot of people have looked down um, on the, in the past as being a bad thing. Um, so what questions do we have? That's basically the dovetail I had for tonight. So I'd love to hear what your okay, thoughts are so on that. Okay, so Danny Sweeney just popped one up. Did I miss where you discussed using a dowel? Uh, um, using a dowel? Yes. I'm guessing you're talking about plugging the hole? I don't know. It literally just popped up, and I've been trying to ah. catch up on other things. No, I haven't talked about that. Um, yeah, if you get a dowel that is the exact same size as your bit, which mine has run off somewhere. My Craig jig drill bit ran away. Um, but if you measure the diameter of the drill bit, oh, there it is. Measure the diameter of the shank. That's the same size of the dowel. You can glue a dowel into the hole and then cut it off flush, plane it off, and you're, and you're good to go. Um, you can also buy Craig Jig dowel plugs, but you end up still having to do the same thing of planing them off and smoothing them out. Um, it just saves you the step of cutting them off beforehand. So, yeah, um, those work pretty well, though. Unless you're talking about, like, dowel joinery. Um, in that case, um, I've never done dowel joinery at an angle. Usually for dowel joinery, I'm going actually going to come in straight in line with the board and drill out a hole the size of the dowel and then pull out that out and then drive in a dowel. In which case I'm going to be using the same dog system on the board, on the table. Uh, let me show you that. Um, so I actually will have this on here. And so when I wanted to drill in, I'd move it over a little ways and then I would bore in from the end this way, straight into it. And this way the dogs still hold this all in place I can drill in my hole while it's still here, drive in the dowel, cut it off flush, move on to the next one. Um, so yeah, that's the way I do most dowel joinery. Troy Jacobson says, I think the dowel was part of the attaching tabletops for a skirt. I'm not sure what you're talking about. I don't know. That's what everyone I, else is I wouldn't chiming in. Use, well, unless you're talking about like a floating dowel like I have upstairs on the dining room table. Um, because in that case, I drilled, um, the base has several dowels sticking out of it, sticking out of it. Um, and then I drilled holes in the top that sit into those, and those holes I drilled are larger than the dowel, so they actually can float around inside the tabletop. And the table is, the top is just held on with gravity, because the top is 200 and some pounds. So I don't have to worry about someone bumping the table around. The pegs are just in there so the top doesn't slide on top of the base. 
Um, I think that's what you might be talking about. I wouldn't want to glue dowels through the skirt into the table because that would not allow for um, expansion and contraction. Okay, I hope we got it. Yeah, if not, let me know. All right, back to some older questions. Alan Smith said, sorry, I missed the, missed the hey, Alan. bit name for the old school pocket hole tool. Can you repeat it and where is a good source to buy it? <laughs> um, it it's called a pocket hole bit. Um, if it's, they are incredibly hard to find. Um, I had been looking for this one for almost two years. And that's one of the reasons why I was really sad that I broke it this morning. <laughs> so just before actually getting to show it off, I broke it. Um, but m I, the only places I've seen them, they're in like a bin of other bits. And I'll end up having to buy this whole package of other bits to get this one. Um, and Shannon Rogers, he has one as well. And he did the exact same thing. He found them in a, in a tool sale with a whole bunch of other bits. Um, I have never seen a place where I can buy these um, other than coming across them on tool sales and um, Midwest tool collectors meets and things like that. So I'm, I'm hoping I can find another one here soon. Um, but they, they're not common and if anyone does have a source I'd love to hear about it. But uh, I don't know of anyone who makes them. And most of these stopped being produced over 100 years ago. So these don't really exist except for rare places where you can find them. And I went and broke one. <laughs> what else we got? Uh, let's see. Um, oh, I forgot to put the time on that one. Um, Mike Bordeaux asked, to make your paste wax, James, do you need to use raw linseed oil or can you use pure BLO, no additives? Uh, you can use anything you want. Paste wax is literally a wax and an oil. Any oil you want, any wax you want, any combination of the two. Um, and that is like, um, there's a, there's a finish called, not, I want to say pure and simple. It's not that, um, but they call it linseed oil, but there's a little bit of wax made into it. Officially it's a paste wax because there's a very little bit of wax mixed in with the oil. Um, so it's, it's still fluid, but it's, it's a paste wax. Um, so you can use any wax you want. I know people who use olive oil and candle wax, um, uh, paraffin wax is common. Um, so, yeah, anything you want. And I have some that are made with raw linseed oil and some that are made with boiled linseed oil. Um, I like the raw linseed oil for my blocks that I uh, lubricate the bottom of my soles with. Um, oh, your I, I find feet's that works frozen. Oh, it is frozen. What's that? Your feet is frozen. Oh, let me go change it. Are you still talking? I'm talking and the overhead is working. The overhead is? Oh, i got to go change that one. My server just died. But, um, yeah, so you're... Uh, any wax you want, any oil you want. Different oils are good in different places. Uh, let's see, this one. Nope. This one. There we go. Three, two, one. Back on. Okay, let's get that back. Um, that's the next there thing I want to purchase is several more uh, HDMI adapters. Um, but yeah, those are 150 bucks a piece. Um, so yeah, different things for different uses. I don't want to use um, boiled linseed oil on my plain soles as it starts to get a little gummy, but for a finishing surface on wood, I do like to use the boiled linseed oil on there. So it depends on what purpose you want for it. Cool, what's next? Um, the image froze right on suddenly happy, James. <laughs> it probably <laughs> froze me in one of those weird... No, you were smiling. Oh, I was smiling, oh, it was nice. Rarely does it do that. <laughs> At least you weren't picking your nose. Um, <laughs> Don't know what you're talking Robert about. Robert <laughs> Dolan Thielen, um, where can you find the pocket hole bit for a brace? Did we just talk about that? Yes, we just talked about I'm it. I'm sorry. I hope that answered your question, Robert, and you were listening. It, basically, you can't find them. <laughs> so if you guys find one or yeah. two, send an extra to James, and he'll love you forever. <laughs> um... Might get you a free strop. I don't know. I'm gonna. I, I'll, I'll definitely I'll, trade a strop for one. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll I, I paid bark. thirty bucks for the bundle that had this one last time, and all the other bits were like worthless to me. I just wanted. We'll that wheel one and bit. deal with you. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, we got caught up on those questions. Um, there were some more. La, 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 la. Someone asked something about wood movement, didn't they? Yes, that's the one I was just finding, Matthew um, Anderson. How much yeah, should we Yeah, wood plan movement for is movement? something that 
a lot of people really worry about wood movement. Like and you, you'll hear someone saying, ooh, the wood's going to explode. It doesn't really do that. Um, and most of the time, if you're talking about small boards, like three inch or less, the wood movement is, is like a plane shaving. Uh, especially if you're in an air-conditioned house, wood movement it doesn't happen that much. Basically, there's two factors that work into how much does wood movement, how much does wood move. Number one, what is the temperature variant? The hotter a room is, the bigger the wood will be. Um, and everything expands and contracts as well. So like epoxy will expand and contract. And for most woods, the temperature expansion and contraction of epoxy is almost identical to the exp temperature expansion and contraction of wood. So that's why having epoxy in wood is not a huge issue. The problem is if you go outside and you start getting into moisture absorption. Um, and so if you're in an air-conditioned house, there isn't a huge swing in moisture change. Uh, but if you are outside, there is a huge change in moisture. And so wood can swell up drastically outside. And so if you have a board outside that's two inches wide, you might have ah, eighth inch to three sixteenths of movement um, throughout the year, or more, depending upon the, the type of wood. Um, so, I mean, you're not talking about a huge amount. Eighth, eighth inch doesn't sound like that much, but it can be if there's joinery holding that together. So if you have something that's cross-grained, that eighth inch can shear off or destroy tenons. Uh, and so it's, it's something that a lot of people really worry about, and if you're working with outdoor stuff, you've got to think about it in everything you do. But for inside, Sometimes you can fudge with things, especially with small pieces, it's not a huge problem. The, the big issue is how wide is the board? Because boards do not expand and contract lengthwise, so with the grain, they don't change this way. And if you're talking about ring growth from the core of the tree to the outside, they don't expand and contract much at all. The expansion and contraction is actually around the tree. Um, and so that's why boards will cup is because they're actually expanding and contracting around the tree. One side of the board is closer to the heart than the other side, and so that one side will expand or contract more than the other side will. Um, so generally, we think about it, the board will expand and contract across the grain. Uh, so if you have a very wide board, that's going to compound over all that, and it's all going to expand and contract. Um, but if your board is only two or three inches wide, you're probably only thinking about a plane, thickness, a plane shaving thickness of change. Uh, that's one of the reasons why wood flooring um, is one of the, the common things if you had a really nice hardwood floor historically, you'd have slats that would be only an inch and a quarter, an inch and a half wide. Because the more small slats you have, the less chance you're going to have gapping between them. Um, and the bigger the slats are, the bigger the, uh, the expansion and contraction will be throughout the year. Uh, or at least the, the bigger it will appear between each of them. So, yeah, um, and if you want to find out more, I actually have a video talking about how wood movement works and talking about the relationship of the rings. So if you search for wood by right wood movement, it'll come up with that video. Though I do want to do an upgraded one on that because I've got a few other ideas that I didn't talk about that people have asked me. So maybe I'll do that soon. What's next? I get, I get lost in your questions because <laughs> <laughs> I'm in and out of them. I'm like, what is he talking about? I don't know. Oh, well, I don't know if it's any different than normal, but... <laughs> All right. Uh, Big Back Fat said, where do you find your tools? They all seem vintage. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't use very many new tools. I do have a few, like I have the, the Veritas back saws um, and a couple other little things. Um, but most all of my tools are, are, are old. Um, and I find them in all sorts of different places. I have a couple of videos on how to find antique tools. So if you search wood by right, how to find antique tools, you'll come up with CrossFit several videos. And if you want to see a concise collection of all the places I know of to buy tools, um, if you go to my website, um, and up at the top it says tools, and that takes you to a page of all the tools that I recommend. But down at the bottom of that page, there's antique tools. So you can actually see where I have that. And I have a map of the world with all the locations on the map I know of, of where you can find antique tools, whether they be at antique stores, or they be at tool meets, or they be stores that sell antique tools, or there are actually antique tools that specifically only deal in antique, antique stores that only deal in antique tools. Um, and they're um, all over the place, you'd be surprised. And if you know of something that isn't on that map, let me know. Um, but that being said, probably somewhere around 60% of all the tools I've ever purchased, I purchased from the Midwest Tool Collectors or one of the other clubs. And all those clubs are also listed on that page as well. Um, so definitely become a member 
and you can get invited to the tool meets where they sell them. And if, so if you imagine a basketball court completely covered in tables and all those tables completely covered in old tools for sale, it's like heaven. <laughs> and take your kids if you have kids because sometimes yes. they make out with free things. Yeah, every time no I take lie. the kids, they, they walk away <laughs> with planes and braces and things like that, and so they all get their own Especially free Especially if your daughter knows something. Yes. <laughs> um, Just telling you. So yeah, the, the, the tool collector uh, clubs are definitely worth it. You, you pay an annual fee. It's like 25 bucks uh, for an entire year. And then you get invited to these different meets. Uh, so they're, they're where I purchase most of my tools. Um, I, I have purchased some online. And there are a lot that, you, I mean, if you're looking for something, you can find it on eBay. But you're going to pay through the nose. eBay is expensive. Um, every now and then you get lucky, but it's, it's pretty hard. Um, but yeah, Midwest Tool Collectors is where I get most of them. What else we got? Um, hang on. Daniel and Zan Fire Eye Furry. I have no idea. <laughs> if you have the opportunity to use power tools in your shop, would you go for it? Um, not that if, if I didn't have a YouTube channel devoted to hand tools, um, yes, I would have a hybrid shop now. Um, I would have a table saw, a planer, a band saw, a powered lathe, um, and I'd probably use them pretty close to 50 50. Um, I use the power tools for getting close to the lines and getting close to the joinery, and then I'd pull out the power, the hand tools to do all the, the detail and fine work and bring things down exactly where I want them. Um, but because I have a YouTube channel that's all devoted to hand tools, um, I get to use hand tools. Um, and I, I, I actually enjoy that, so I, I like it. But do I tell people, this is the way it's going to be done, this is the best way? No. You can do it whatever way you want. There's, a, there's no best way. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm getting a lot of questions about wood and contracting and movement. And so I think we need to make a... I need to do a whole video on wood movement I, again. I, and wood movement and different... Cool. Using yeah, different um, things. Actually, if you guys can help me out with that. Um, Number one, go and watch my video on wood movement. So type wood by right wood movement and you'll come across it. Um, and let me know what questions it brings up. Um, send them to me on my, on my, uh, my website and I'll add those to the, the video. So I might end up doing that. That would actually be a good one for next week because I'm going to be pretty cramped from putting out videos because I'm going to be gone. So that might be a very good talk. Okay, wood so yeah, right send me ideas on that and we'll do that. Oh, also, um, is anyone live who is going to be at the peach meet? Let me know. Um, so I'm looking forward to that and being there. Uh, it's Friday and Saturday, so this is going to be a lot of fun. The biggest tool sale in all the South. And my wife's not going to be there, so this could be scary. Wait, that was a way too big of a smile for that. <laughs> I'm, no. You're okay, also I'm not missing your mother-in-law's birthday. <laughs> you better bring me back something good. Cool. Well, we got about four minutes left, one, maybe two questions. Okay, um, then I don't know that we're going to get through all of these. Probably not. If we don't okay. get to your question, send me an email. Uh, let's see. Tyler Pestle says, have you thought of embracing the pocket hole as a showcase feature of a project using, such as using different sizes and species of wood as plugs? Um, I have actually thought of that, but I haven't thought of a way to make it artistic or different. Um, I mean, I've thought about actually plugging without the screw um, <laughs> and actually like doing a mortise and tenon, but then putting the plug into it, make it look like that. I, I've thought about doing that, um, but I haven't really thought of a way to actually use the joinery and still make it decorative. I, I, I've tried to, but I haven't come up with a way that's like, oh, yes, I could do that. So um, if anyone has any ideas on that, let me know. Okay, so I have a question of where exactly is the peach meat? Uh, it is in Madison, Georgia. Um, and what you're going to want to do is if you are not a member and you didn't get an invite, then if you go to Midwest Tool Collectors, um, MWTCA.com, there's a link down below. Um, you go there and you can find the, uh, it has a, a tab for meats. Go down to the bottom of that for local meats and it will list out all of the local meats where they're at. And each of the local meats has a, has a, a person's name and a phone number. That is the person who is running that meat. And you'll want to contact them and get um, location information because you do have to contact them ahead of time or know someone who's going there. Um, and you can sign up and become a member at the door. 
Um, so you can show up and do that. It's a little more expensive to pay at the door rather than paying ahead of time, um, but uh, you can do that. So definitely go on there. Um, I wish I knew who the person was, um, but you'll find his, their phone number on the website. Give them a call and say, hey, I'm showing up. Um, is there anything you need from me? And they'll give you all the information on that. But yes, if you're going, I'd love to, uh, love to say, hey, I'll be there both days. Now, are you doing an official meetup? Uh, no, I won't be doing an official meetup, but I'll be, I'll be hanging around. So feel free to come up and say, hey. Um, and I will be doing a, a live video on both Friday and Saturday showing all the tools. So if you're not able to come and you still want to drool over tools, I'll, I'll help you out. <laughs> Those are always a lot of fun. Cool. Um, you have are one you, more? Um, I'm trying to think of one that... I'm gonna, some of these I'm going to save because I think if you're going to do the wood movement, okay. um, but we'll, we'll end on a fun one. Big Back f Fat said, are flannels a must for woodworking? Oh, yes, they're a must, except for in the summer. <laughs> I, have, I have like six or seven flannel shirts that I wear throughout the winter, and this is pretty much, I, I always have a flannel on during the winter. During the summer, it's all T-shirts. So that's where I get to wear all my um, the other channels and things like that, I have T-shirts on. So, But yeah, of course flannels are good for woodworking. I said they come with a mandatory time. beard as well. Yeah, yeah, you got to have the beard. <laughs> hey, the shaved head's coming in style, too. Well, I think you'd just be too shiny if you didn't have the beard. <laughs> cool. Well, I think that's about it. Um, if I didn't get to your question, feel free to send me a message. You can find a contact on my website, and I do answer all those. I don't answer them immediately, but I try and get to them as, as soon as I can. So feel free to send me a contact there. Yeah, and some of these we will probably answer next yeah. week. So you have to come back. If you have uh -huh. a wood movement question, um, Definitely look at my other video and then send me your ideas and I'll try and make a video next week on wood movement. It sounds like it's uh, and it one that a lot of people will are will not about. be Tuesday next week. No, we will be doing it uh, the live Wednesday next week. Um, I'll put out a notification on our website, but probably Wednesday. So, yeah, I think that's about it. And until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye. Now we find play the button.